Very good. Uh, so your goals are probably going to get drilled into you in other classes. I'm not going to spend a ton of time talking about goals, but it is really important because goals determine when we start medications. And so you need to know when to start medications to know which medications to start. Uh, basically, hypertension is if you're over 140 or over 90, you can be considered hypertensive. Of course, there are stratifications under that, which we're going to talk about here in a second. Uh, super common. Um, a lot of patients have it and they aren't diagnosed. It's a really easy thing to test, as we all know. So um, more or less, uh, kind of the cornerstone of, I think, like internal medicine, primary care uh, revolves around blood pressure management. Uh, pretty much all patients will get blood hypertension at some point in their life. Uh, it's something that happens as we age. And it may be mild in some patients. Some people might not get it at all. But if you're 95 and you aren't on a little bit of lisinopril, it's probably a pretty rare case. So um, silent killer, high blood pressure is often called that. You have an increased risk of stroke, MI, and heart failure development if your blood pressure isn't managed correctly. So um, while blood pressure increases don't really do anything acutely, except in certain circumstances that we aren't really going to talk about today, um, they do do things over time. So they damage your blood vessels over time, which leads to the complications you see listed here. Um, acute changes in blood pressure can be managed more aggressively. I'm going to reserve those conversations for our critical care and emergency medicine lectures that we're going to have next summer. So you can kind of put that stuff to the side. However, I will talk about some of the medications that are available in IV or PO format just for the sake of reference. Okay, so etiology, um, central hypertension is about 90% of patients will uh, present like this. There's not really an identifiable cause for most patients' hypertension. Um, there's a link to things like obesity, dietary sodium intake. I should probably have like smoking on here too. Uh, but no real smoking gun. Um, sometimes it's a combination of those things. Secondary hypertension uh, could be caused by primary aldosteronism, renal uh, parenchymal disease, thyroid or parathyroid disease, and uh, possibly medication induced as well. Okay, so our first step, we can't ignore non-pharmacologic causes because these are really important, especially if somebody's in that prehypertensive stage. So sodium's role in fluid retention is uh, critical in people who are kind of on the borderline of that prehypertension, uh, stage one hypertension phase. And what we want to do is try and uh, educate them on limiting sodium intake or keeping their sodium intake low. Now, sodium is kind of an interesting thing because by itself, um, as long as your kidneys are functioning, you should be clearing any excess sodium your body ingests. But if you are chronically consuming a ton of sodium, that's where you can see fluid retention start to build up over time and, and possibly contribute to um, hypertension. If you have hypertension, then uh, you want to be more conscious of it. So it's not necessarily that it causes hypertension, because I think that's a little bit debatable, but it's certainly something that we want to watch out for if somebody is having hypertension, because um, it's going to contribute to to additive effects of that blood pressure going up. Maintaining healthy body weight. Uh, caffeine intake is a common thing that can increase people's blood pressure. How much coffee are you drinking a day? Uh, can you cut back reasonably? Those are things to think about. Um, exercise can help lower blood pressure. Life stressors, people who are chronically stressed or work in really high stress environments tend to have higher blood pressure. Uh, smoking, uh, moderate ethanol use uh, should be encouraged over like you know heavy ethanol use. Um, <laughs> that we'd encourage that really in any situation that I can think of, um, maybe after finals or something. Uh, uh, I shouldn't say that at Buffalo, sorry. <laughs> uh, all right, removing medications. So there's not really a ton of medications that I can think of off the top of my head that are heavily associated with increasing blood pressure, NSAIDs probably being the biggest one. Um, so remember, we talked very briefly about like the cyclooxygenase enzymes and things like that. Um, so these uh, prevent prostaglandins. If you inhibit that process, you prevent your body's endogenous pathways to producing prostaglandins. Those are natural vasodilators. And if you don't have that process on board, you can kind of um, restrict your body's availability of those vasodilators to be the good housekeeping ones that you want sticking around your body that can help with some vascular resistance uh, adjustments. And you limit your body's ability to respond to hemodynamic changes. And in that case, you end up um, with uh, somebody like on a chronic ibuprofen regimen for osteoarthritis. Because you're shutting down their prostaglandin production, you may see an increase in blood pressure. So sometimes you got to weigh the good and the bad. So is it worth having them on that medication and then maybe on an antihypertensive? Because they, it might be working really well for their arthritis and they want to stay on it. So just something to consider. But if somebody's popping a lot of NSAIDs for no reason, um, or they haven't ever tried Tylenol, which doesn't really have the same blood pressure effects, but we'll get to all that during pain later. It's just something to kind of keep in the back of your head for right now.
Okay, so the most recent um, goals from AHA came out in 20, well, they're called the 2017 guidelines. Um, I think they were published late 2017, maybe early 2018. But um, the goal is basically the same for everyone. You should be less than 130 over 80. Um, when you're in between, so you can see how they stratify it here, it gets a little complicated as to how you treat patients and what you recommend. And I'll get to those differences here in a, a little bit. Um, some of the questions about the 2017 guidelines that came up were, um, or the controversy I should say, are do older patients get a break? So previously there was some recommendations that if you have a patient over a certain age, they shouldn't have be held to as high restrictions on their blood pressure. So the problem is, is targeting older patients, you end up increasing doses, it's harder to get them to go. And so you end up with increased side effects, you end up being prone to certain um, times of the day, being more hypotensive than others. And it's just difficult to meet goal, which also, uh, if you think about like the financial impact of uh, being a practicing provider in a, a, a practice environment that might be uh, outcomes based versus like pay for service. So a lot of our billing models are going more towards good outcomes. So they might say, all right, how many of your patients are within goal blood pressure? And if all your elderly patients can't meet that because the guidelines changed and recommended 130 over 80 versus 140 over 90, that could impact possibly how much money you get or your practice gets each year. So it is, it does have a big impact. These guidelines do have ripple effects throughout the healthcare community. And then more relaxed for healthy individuals, which I'll talk about here in, in a slide, I think the next slide. So. So the first slide would be kind of like a healthy person that you think of. So they have no cardiovascular disease. Cardiovascular disease would be anything related to um, like anything from heart failure to atrial fibrillation to they've had a heart attack before, something like that. Um, and a 10-year um, ACVD, ASCVD risk of less than uh, 10%. So if your risk score is less than 10% and you don't have any heart disease uh, to speak of, um, you really don't need to, to aggressively treat that person. So their goal blood pressure is still 130 over 80, but you don't start medications on them. So these would be a per person like, let's say they come in and their blood pressure is 135 over 85. So it's a little bit elevated. Um, you'd recommend lifestyle modifications for a person like that. You wouldn't start that person on a medication until they peaked over that, so until they hit that 140 mark. And that was a new thing with the 2017 guidelines, a little bit of a change to make it a little more relaxed recommendation so we aren't prescribing meds for everyone in that middle of the ground range. Because a lot of the times what they find out is when they target these really aggressive ranges, the evidence doesn't line up to say that that gives a positive mortality benefit. It usually just doesn't show anything. So you're kind of net neutral. And then again, you're talking about adding medications, increasing doses, increasing side effects uh, for patients when you don't really need to be because you aren't seeing the benefit. Uh, the second bullet point is CBD, uh, existing CBD, or a 10-year uh, risk score greater than 10%. Start medications when your blood pressure is over 129, over 79, and also for the following conditions. So CBD would be, of course, one of the things. The risk factor is another arm, and then also people with diabetes, chronic kidney disease, or age 65 or older. So interestingly enough, they're actually recommending more aggressive guidelines for people who are older. Uh, people who are older than 65 just naturally have higher risk of MI and stroke. It happens as we age. Um, so the idea is to maybe be more aggressive in those patient populations to limit that from happening. But again, you kind of run into these issues, especially with your you know, 85 plus populations. I mean, do you still manage those patients as aggressively? Or what happens about the 95 year old lady you have? How aggressively do you manage her blood pressure? Um, that's just things you're gonna have to consider throughout your practice. And there's the guidelines will tell you to do one thing. And remember guidelines are guidelines. They they recommend things based on evidence. They aren't a firm rule, so they aren't going to apply to every single patient you see. If you have um, an AC, an ASCVD risk score greater than 10%, and you're kind of a younger patient, um, you can do the calculator here. And you'll see what kind of variables you can plug in there. Sometimes if somebody is really out of whack on one single variable, it might push them over in score, um, even if all their other labs look normal. And so that's one of the, the controversies because people are like, well, all these people are scoring somewhat like in the maybe you know 7 to 10% range where they, they don't really have any overt health concerns. There may be a person in their 50s who's relatively healthy otherwise, but they just happen to score high just because of how the calculator is set up. So again, there's some controversy on that, and if we really should be following that. But this calculator has been in play 
for a number of years now. It used to be called like the Framingham Risk Score, and they slightly tweak it every few years and rename it, but it's essentially the same thing. So it's looking at things like lipids and blood pressure and um, like history of uh, relatives with cardiovascular disease and things like that. So it gives you scores based on those types of criteria. Um, this slide is really busy and there's a lot of stuff on it, but I actually think it's a really great reference for where to start people because the guidelines don't give you, they give you a, a pretty broad approach to what medications to start somebody on for an antihypertensive. Uh, we're going to talk about all those and I'm going to give you some of my opinions on where to go. But this is a really great slide that I think lays it out nicely from, that I stole from up to date that um, shows you, you know, what might you consider for a certain person with for example, benign prostatic hyperplasia. So maybe you have a 55-year-old male. He's got a little bit of elevated blood pressure, but nothing else. But he also has BPH. He's having some urinary retention. Um, alpha blockers are used for BPH. They also lower blood pressure. It's a great option for a patient. And it's not a first-line recommendation in the guidelines. But in that case, you might actually consider it in a first-line place because it's going to treat two conditions with one drug. So there's some areas where this is nice. But you can see for the most part, we're looking at pretty much the same types of drugs. Um, ACE inhibitors, ARBs, beta blockers, uh, depending on what types of things you're looking at. So, and sometimes you're looking at both. So anyway, we'll go through those and we'll talk about which ones are recommended in which scenarios. But for the most part, um, you can think about it that I, I like to think about like structural heart disease. So like CHF patients uh, are going to be on both, but like a beta blocker is always going to be indicated for somebody with, with like post MI or um, CHF. Um, ACE inhibitors are, or ARBs are basically always first line in almost in every case. So you can see they apply pretty much to the majority of the big com compelling indications or other um, uh, pathways you might see and, and recommend on somebody. But then again, there's some other odd things here that they include as well. But that's just something that, I, again, I think it's a good reference to have. Because that happens a lot where it's like, well, I've got this person, I'm going to start them on a thing. So which one of these four drug classes do I go with? Well. Uh, depends on where they are. So that's um, that's something we'll approach as we, at the end of the lecture, I'll go through some of those scenarios specifically and some sort of where the evidence lies on a couple of them. Uh, but let's talk about it from the perspective of a brand new hy hypertensive patient that we're going to treat. So the guidelines will say if you have somebody who meets the criteria for hypertension, you can treat them with any of the four classes listed below. So thiazides, long-acting dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers, or CCBs, uh, ACE inhibitors or angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors and angiotensin 2 receptor blockers or ARBs or ARBs are often referred to as ARBs. Um, strategy, basically mix and match classes. You can do this to your heart's content. The only caveat is you can't mix the second two, so you don't mix ACE inhibitors with ARBs. Uh, there's been some studies looking at trialing them. I'll talk about the mechanism here and why that actually might make sense, you know, from a purely scientific point of view or, or if you just look at the way the renin angiotensin aldosterone system works it does kind of make sense to combine them but uh, they haven't shown that there's any benefit to doing that alternate agents uh, beta blockers you'll see were a long time for for a long time were one of the first line antihypertensive agents but um, they have fallen out of favor and aren't recommended for a first line option unless you meet one of the compelling indications like we just talked about okay I have a question. yeah so do you do two like um, so you have like a yes. Or like I think that. I have that. Do I have that on a slide here? I think I might have that on a later slide. But yes, you can start two, and I think the criteria is like if you're over 20, over 10 systolic diastolic over your goal, you can start two drugs at one time. So yeah, then you'd pick two within the same class. And usually you want to get somebody on all three in this group because you, again you're considering three and four, basically one here. And then after that, um, you would add on something else. So if they're on all three of those at good doses, tolerating well, then you'd maybe go to a beta blocker or something like that. Assuming we're just talking about essential hypertension and no other compelling indications. All right, let's talk about the drugs in the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. So there's three classes of drugs here. We've talked about two of them briefly already. Um, the way that this works is um, it's all about uh, production in the kidneys. So ACE inhibitors have to be able to um, do a couple things here, and they're going to be the, the mainstay of therapy we're really going to talk about. All the evidence based on heart failure mortality and um, stroke improvements and strokes and things like that, and post-MI, uh, rebound MI um, care and things like that, all are based on ACE inhibitor data. So 
Uh, they're kind of the big guns. They've been around for a while and they're still widely, widely used, still accepted as kind of the, the standard of care for a lot of things. Um, ACE inhibitors have a primary mechanism of preventing the conversion of angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. So the enzyme, angiotensin converting enzyme, is what does that, and the drug specifically binds to that enzyme, prevents it from doing that, therefore you don't get angiotensin 2. Angiotensin 2 is a pretty potent vasoconstrictor. Um, so by doing that, we're preventing um, certain workloads on the heart, so you actually decrease afterload and preload to a certain degree by uh, taking care of um, the, the conversion of angiotensin 2. Now, you aren't shutting the process down completely, but um, it does a pretty good job of doing that. You don't really need angiotensin 2 for, for anything specifically. It's designed, the whole system is designed to be a stress response, right? So if you have certain stressors in the body, your body kicks up this system, you end up with angiotensin 2 circulating, you vasoconstrict, you pump blood to your core, your heart can pump harder and stronger and push more blood out, and that's all good, but if you do that over time and long term, that's where you get damage. So uh, preventing the conversion of that is one of the major uh, steps we take to uh, prevent hypertension and then some other things as well. So if ACE inhibitors, uh, ACE inhibitors also do this other mechanism over here. So bradykinin is a, a vasodilator as well, and um, angiotensin converting enzyme also degrades bradykinin. So ACE inhibitors prevent that as well. So you get a second mediator as well that works on these bradykinin receptors, which is a separate mechanism. So you actually have two mechanisms that the ACE inhibitors are preventing the degradation of, or in one case, they're preventing the degradation of a vasodilator. In the other case, they're preventing the production or conversion of a vasoconstrictor. So overall, you get vasodilation um, with ACE inhibitors. One of the things that you'll notice angiotensin 1 receptor blockers don't do is have anything to do with bradykinin. So that's one of the theories why people think ACE inhibitors are a little bit more effective than an ARB or an angiotensin receptor blocker is because they have this dual mechanism here. And with angiotensin 1 receptor blockers, all you're doing is blocking angiotensin 2 from interacting with the receptor. So you're blocking its end effect to have that vasoconstrictive effect in certain parts of the body. So back to what I was saying earlier, you can kind of see how, well, if you're preventing the or the conversion of angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2, um, but you can't do that completely because the body's always going to make some more, then you can, then you can probably stop. Um, what if you block the rest of it with the ARB? So again, there are studies that looked at that theory there, and they just, again, didn't find any difference there. Uh, and then the final drug in this class of three is the renin inhibitors. Renin inhibitors are really only, there's only one drug on the market actually right now, and it's not a super important one. Uh, one thing that happens with these medications, and I'm gonna getting putting the cart ahead of the horse a little bit here, but we'll talk about it because the slide's got a nice picture on it. Uh, one thing that people get with ACE inhibitors and angiotensin uh, blockers is uh, an anaphylactic reaction called angioedema. Have you guys talked about angioedema a little bit? Basically, it's usually throat swelling, tongue swelling. Um, people need to be intubated if they get it generally. It's relatively uncommon. Actually, it's quite rare, I should say. However, so many people take angioten take drugs in this class, so either ARBs or ACEs, that um, we see it pretty frequently. So when you have 20 to 50 million people in the United States on these medications, you have a fairly high incidence, whereas it's actually pretty rare if you look at the numbers. But uh, because of that, sometimes they'll try different things in the category. So um, again, we're kind of putting the cart ahead of the buggy here and where we go with that, but I'll, I'll follow up on that in a second. But that's why we have the renin inhibitor, because the idea is, is that we want more options in this category to be available for patients to shut down the system. And the renin inhibitor acts more upstream. It prevents angiotensinogen from converting to angiotensin 1, so it prevents it even further up from stopping this bad mediator, angiotensin 2, from uh, showing up. Um, so the renin inhibitors, again, they're newer. The, the one drug out there is newer. It's just not used all that much, but it is an option. We'll talk about it more functionally here in a second. Okay, so I've already talked about these. Aldosterone antagonists, I'm not going to talk about a ton during this lecture. They don't really have a role in hypertension. They have much more impact in heart failure, so we'll talk about that there. Um, so anyway, ACE inhibitors, let's talk about these a lot. They're a uh, first, line first line for multiple indications. And again, they've been around a while. Lots of good data associated with them. They end in PRIL, so they're pretty easy to recognize if you're looking to, to recognize an ACE inhibitor right away. There's not really any other drugs that sound like them. Um, there's some class side effects. So uh, another thing about ACE inhibitors is because of bradykinin, um, 
one of the things that happens when you, well, one of the theorized mechanisms, is when you get too much bradykinin circulating, you're somehow causing some vasodilation effects in the lungs and the pulmonary vasculature. And so people get this kind of dry, non-productive cough as a reflex. And it's thought because the ACEs aren't degradating, because ACE isn't around to degrade, degrade uh, bradykinin as much as it would normally. And uh, people tend to get a cough with ACE inhibitors. It's a relatively common side effect. Again, it's non-productive. It's not associated with infectious disease or anything like that. Um, and it's relatively harmless. It's just annoying. So sometimes people start an ACE inhibitor, they get a cough, and what do we give them? We switch them to an ARB at that point. So the ARB's primary role is uh, to switch somebody off of, from a, a, an ACE inhibitor who has a cough. That's really why they were invented uh, as an alternative. Um, they have uh, they have a good role in hypertension, so it doesn't mean you have to wait until somebody's failed an ACE inhibitor. As the guidelines would say, you can start somebody on a, on an ARB right away. And somebody might say, or maybe me, let's say I get blood diagnosed with hypertension, and you come to me and say, oh, Chad, I want to start you on lisinopril. I'm like, no, I don't want to deal with the cough. I don't even care if it's 10% risk. Just start me on Losartan, which is an ARB. So some people might actually care about that. And you, as a provider, might say, I don't want to deal with the cough either. I'm just going to start my people with high blood pressure on low sartan. That's fine. There's no, no problem with doing that. So I don't want to make it make it sound like you have to use the ACE inhibitor before you use the ARB. You could go either one. They're, they're all generic now and relatively cheap, so it doesn't really matter. Yeah? Would you switch, potentially switch back to an ACE if the ARB not cutting it? Or if... Yeah, the ACE is probably going to give you more bang, bang for your buck. And there are some conditions where it's debatable whether the ARB is actually a good alternative because we just don't have the body of evidence. So like for heart failure patients, MI patients, the evidence is all with ACE inhibitors. So there's some question there is if you're treating that condition and blood pressure at the same time, is it okay to substitute? And most people would say yes, but again, the evidence is, is scant for ARBs compared to ACE inhibitors. Um, angioedema, we talked about that, again, quite rare, but definitely one of the things people remember about these medications. If you work in emergency medicine, um, you will see ACE inhibitor-induced angioedema at some point. It's real, Again, lots of people take them, and it can happen really any time you're on the drug. So technically, you could be on it for five years and still be at risk for the reaction, which is very strange. So sometimes you'll have somebody coming in with angioedema, and it's like, yeah, I've been on lisinopril for three years. Well, here you go. It's more common to see it right away, like most allergic reactions, but it is something that can happen later, which is very strange to me. But the body works in weird ways. Uh, renal dysfunction. I'm not going to get into this a ton, I don't think, this lecture, but basically what happens is you can have some issues with the way that the kidneys um, process fluids. So um, your glomerulus has an afferent and efferent arter arterioles, and what happens is it uh, the ACE inhibitor causes vasodilation on the afferent side, and you can't generate, uh, sorry, on the efferent side, excuse me. And so what happens is you can't generate as much pressure within the glomerulus, which is okay for the most part. But if you combine that with something like an NSAID, which causes vasoconstriction on the opposite side, you can end up with no pressure and kidney damage. So sometimes people get a little nervous with these because they um, potentially can cause increases in renal dysfunction. However, we're going to talk about them again when we talk about kidney disease, and they're actually renally protective to a certain degree, too. So they're a little bit confusing on that. What I like to think about with these is they don't cause kidney damage unless you're hypovolemic or you have, you're taking a lot of NSAIDs. Those are the kind of the two big ones that I would say don't combine with those. And usually it requires all three to really see acute kidney injury with them. Generally, I don't think of ACE inhibitors as renally toxic. Sometimes they'll hold them during acute kidney injury, but that's a separate topic we'll discuss later. Um, so the thing to remember is that these do have some effects in the kidneys. Generally by themselves, they're fine. In fact, they've been shown to preserve kidney function in diabetic patients over time too. And so we don't really worry about it too much. You may see a little bit of a transient uh, BUN serum creatinine increase on people with, uh, with uh, initiation of ACE inhibitors, but it's not something to be concerned about. You also might see some elevation of potassium. Usually it might go up slightly at the beginning of therapy. We don't really get concerned about that unless you see a big increase or unless they already have uh, an increase in potassium. And those would really be like renal failure, chronic kidney disease patients. You'd get more concerned about that. And a healthier patient with good functioning kidneys, probably not something to be concerned about with an ACE alone, at least. So side effect wise, very well tolerated. Um, you got the cough, that's going to be the biggest reason people don't take them. And then you've got angioedema, which is going to be the most significant side effect. The rest of this stuff, uh, besides the renal stuff that we'll get to later this semester, uh, don't worry about it a whole lot. 
Um, beneficial effects, so we, again, we talked about suppression of angiotensin 1 and the decreased bradykinin degradation. Overall, very well tolerated. Again, very highly effective medications that have been proven and used for years. These are the ACE inhibitors on the market right now. Again, they all end in pril. They're all essentially equally effective. There's not one that's better than the other. Lisinopril is by far the most commonly one used. It's once daily dosed, although sometimes it's got like an 18-hour half-life. So some people get fancy and they're like, well, I'm going to dose it twice a day because I want continuous coverage. It's like, eh. Um, it wasn't really studied for twice daily dosing. It was studied for once daily dosing. So however you want to do it is fine. But vast majority of people I see take it once daily. Um, the other ones, again, don't really have a disadvantage. Captopril and enalapril are like three times a day to take, so they aren't quite as convenient. Um, Ramapril and Benazapril have been newer ACEs, and I believe they're both generic now. Um, some people will argue they're a little more potent than lisinopril, but there's no evidence to back that up. However, if you aren't getting effects from one of them, or um, maybe if somebody... Sometimes people might say, well, if somebody gets a cough on lisinopril, they might not get it on another one. I don't necessarily believe that. But every once in a while I see people on one of these, it's rare. Again, lisinopril is probably 95% of the people out there who are on an ACE take lisinopril. The rest of them are varying degrees of, of unusualness. So It's good to know them all because it's good to recognize ACE inhibitors. But uh, again, for my purposes of this class, an ACE inhibitor is an ACE inhibitor. I don't care about you know the differences of them. Uh, this is just what I was talking about with the kidney disease. Um, so here's our what I was just talking about, where you have the um, afferent artery or the efferent ar arterial, excuse me, dilated, um, which again isn't a problem unless you cut off the flow to this side of it too. Then your glomerulus can't perfuse itself, and then you get kidney disease or kidney damage. Um, ACE inhibitors are also contraindicated in pregnancy. They have teratogenic effects. So for pregnant patients, they're one of the few classes we can't use for um, hypertension and for um, Part, uh, peripartum hypertension is a, definitely a big thing, of course, so that's uh, something to, to remember. Uh, but I'll talk about some options for um, pregnancy in a little bit here. Okay, ARBs, again, kind of considered interchangeable with the ACEs. Uh, you don't really get a cough on them, so that's the good option to go to. Uh, bradykinin degrades, degrades normally. <clears throat> Same effects, precautions. If somebody has angioedema on an ACE inhibitor, it's not recommended to try an ARB. There's about a 10% cross-reactivity, and it's high enough that we don't think that's a good idea. Um, you might have a situation where, like, you have a heart failure patient, and somebody's really aggressive. It says, this person needs to be on one of these drugs. They had angioedema with an ACE inhibitor. I'm going to roll the dice and try this. It's a little risky. Um, if you're going to do that, they should be hospitalized, just because you if that happens, you want to have access to emergency medicine, um, intubation, epinephrine, stuff like that. You treat it just like you would any anaphylactic reaction, but still, it's life-threatening if you're not doing it correctly. Um, doo -doo -doo. It might not raise serum creatinine quite as much. Um, it might be a little bit easier on the kidneys from that perspective. It might not quite constrict that uh, efferent, or sorry, I'm just messing up my terms, dilate that efferent arterial quite as much. Again, we don't use it in combination with the ACI, one or the other. The names end in Sartan. It's another easy one to remember because they're all essentially equivalent. They all have the same type of the name. Um, more data is available for the ACE. I've talked about that already. So the body of data really is out there for ACEs, and ARBs kind of ride their coattails. Um, well, Sartan's the most common one. It, the only reason is because it was the first one to go generic. It's probably the least potent of them. So sometimes you will see the argument that, well, I'm going to switch them to Valsartan because it's, uh, it's a more potent option. That's true, technically. Um, this is, again, a little bit of gray area because we don't have the body of evidence with ARBs. So there's more, I think, wiggle room for argument that, well, if I do a more potent ARB, maybe I get better effects than I do Losartan. Um, well, Sartan, again, was just the most popular one because of its cost. Uh, Valsartan's gone generic now, uh, so it's relatively inexpensive. And the other four, I believe, are all brand name for the time being, but they've been around a while. I'd imagine they're going to go generic in the next two years, most of them. Uh, the one direct renin inhibitor on the market, Eliscarin or Tecturna, again, I don't care you know a ton about this other than just knowing what it is. It's um, going to be the option you're going to try if uh, somebody has, um, if it, again, if you're not having a, well, sorry, I'm trying to think of how I want to say this, because uh, it really doesn't have much of a role. But um, so anyway, let me just go through my slide. <laughs> similar effects, uh, so similar effects of hypertension as other rest drugs. So it's not any more effective. It's not really any less effective either. Um, the adverse effects are similar as well as far as like the kidney related things. So you still get all that stuff. 
you don't use it in combination. So again, it's been studied that way. And actually, people who use it in combination had much higher potassiums than they did otherwise. Um, not be shown to be beneficial as an ARB, uh, more side effects, uh, really not well established. Again, this is the drug that you might try if somebody's got angioedema on an ACE inhibitor because the cross-reactivity is not thought to be very high. However, there's not a lot of evidence to support that either, um, but that's really the only role we see this drug used in. Definitely not a go-to. Um, aldosterone antagonists I'm mostly going to skip right now. Some people call them potassium-sparing diuretics. They aren't really useful for hypertension. We'll come back to them uh, during the heart failure lecture and talk about them more in context there. Uh, here they are for the sake of discussion. And again, we'll talk about those later. OK, moving on to diuretics. Uh, we'll, we'll focus mostly on thiazide diuretics and talk about loops, again, in context during, uh, during heart failure. Uh, but the thiazide diuretic has been the historical mainstay of treatment for hypertension for several years and decades. Still really relevant today. In fact, there was a big trial that was published called the All Hat Trial uh, several years ago that looked at um, some of these newer fancy drugs. So drugs like lisinopril and amlodipine at one point, believe it or not, were brand name and were expensive. And so somebody did a trial and said, all right, do thiazide di are these drugs that are new, calcium, so amlodipine is a calcium channel blocker, and lisinopril we just talked about. So are these new ACE inhibitors and calcium channel blockers really better than our existing thiazide diuretics that we've used to manage hypertension since the 50s? And no, they actually aren't any better. And that's why the guidelines still put thiazides in a first-line option, because they are really effective at managing hypertension. They don't really do much else. That's really their only role as an essential hypertension. So they're a little bit limited. You won't really see them as listed under the compelling indications slide because they don't really have a lot of compelling indications to use a thiazide. So that's why the, the other drug classes have a little bit more of an advantage because if you do have a patient who has diabetes or you do have a patient who has structural heart disease, um, you end up sh um, kind of shuffling this one to the side because it doesn't really make sense to use it because there's no added benefit there. Um, when these were first came out, the doses were really high. The doses have dropped. Um, usually when you increase a dose of a thiazide, you get significant diminishing returns. So, for example, hydrochlorothiazide starting dose is about 12 and a half milligrams. You can go up to 25 and you might get some added benefit. If you increase to 50 after that, you basically don't get any benefit whatsoever. So your starting dose is almost your end dose with these drugs. They do inhibit, uh, so their, their mechanism is, oh, I didn't even talk about this diagram. Sorry, I kind of skipped over this. Um, let's talk about where these work in the glomerulus. So different diuretics work in different spots. Um, so they work on different transport systems, basically. And so by manipulating the way electrolytes flow through the glomerulus, they manipulate the way water moves through the glomerulus. So you have a couple different options here. Chironic anhydrase inhibitors we'll barely talk about today. I don't care. You know those. They don't have any role in cardiovascular medicine. Um, loop diuretics work, work in the loop of Henry, Henley. They work on this potassium sodium chloride co-transporter. And thiazides work on the sodium chloride transporter here. And then potassium sparing diuretics retain potassium at the end of the glomerulus before you go to urine excretion. So what you'll see sometimes is uh, combinations of these used in varying degrees. And we'll talk about that here. But for the most part, what thiazides are doing is inhibiting sodium resorption. And by that, you increase sodium and water excretion because it stays within the glomerulus instead of following sodium back out of the glomerulus and getting reabsorbed. And uh, you increase potassium and hydrogen ion excretion. So you can see some electrolyte imbalances with these. You don't really see enough hypokalemia uh, to make a big difference. And so most patients don't have to take like a potassium supplement on these. But you will see these sometimes combined with these um, potassium sparing diuretics. So the things that I kind of blew through here, like you might see them combined with like eplerinone or maybe aldactone or something like that just to retain the, the potassium if their potassium is kind of slipping a little bit. And um, people have packaged these together for years. So there's a lot of combination products that include hydrochlorothiazide. It's like hydrochlorothiazide plus a potassium sparing diuretic. And so it's one pill. There's no problem with doing that. Again, if the you shouldn't really need to, but if your patient's potassium is kind of chronically on that low end, it might be enough to, to keep them normal. And that's no problem there. You probably aren't going to get a whole lot of added antihypertensive effects from that potassium sparing diuretic. Its goal is really just to keep that potassium circulating back into the body. Um, 
it caused some secondary vasodilation. Uh, that's minimal. You, its main mechanism is its decreased uh, fluid uh, in the body. But um, there is some thought that maybe this is more important than we think, but no one really knows how that would work because these are primarily working in the kidneys. So why they would cause vasodilation somewhere else is up for debate. Um, adverse effects, big one, you're going to cause people to pee a lot. And people don't generally like doing that unless, you know, I don't think anyone really likes doing that. So that's going to be probably the biggest customer complaint if you want to think about it that way. Um, your patients aren't necessarily going to like that. So I really, that's probably my biggest hang up with these drugs is you really have to have a patient who understands that's going to be something that they're going to have. So access to a bathroom. If you have somebody who doesn't have frequent access to a bathroom, so like I think of like a bus driver or somebody like that, uh, probably not a great drug to try them on. And again, we have other drugs within the first line category. So this one kind of takes a backseat to me. If I'm going to pick one of these for myself, this is going to be the fourth choice I would pick. I wouldn't go with it just because of that side effect. It's annoying. And um, I'd rather try something else first. But that's me. Um, guidelines would say it's fine. And again, it works great as an antihypertensive agent. So there's no problem there. But it's just my personal opinion. Um, other than that, there's some other mild things to consider. If somebody doesn't have good kidney function to begin with, thiazides won't work. They have to get into the kidneys and into the glomerulus. So if you don't have good filtration to begin with, if your creatinine clearance is diminished or you have acute kidney disease or if you have chronic kidney disease, um, it's not, the drugs just aren't going to have an effect. So that's something that we, we can't use these in patients with like advanced stage CKD. There's some uh, evidence that you might increase your risk of developing diabetes if you don't have diabetes on these thiazides, but that's a little bit minimal. I don't think that's a something to, to stop you. It's not like it's a contraindication or anything like that, but it's a consideration. Okay. Um, the two thiazides that are important from a blood pressure perspective are the first two. So hydrochlorothiazide is the most commonly used one, and then there's chlorothaladone. Chlorothaladone is about one and a half to two times as potent. It's also much longer acting. Um, some people will make the argument that chlorothaladone is the drug we should be using because almost all the studies on Hypertension and thiazide diuretics were done with chlorothaladone, not with hydrochlorothiazide, and it's a much more potent diuretic. So certainly if you aren't getting a response with HCTZ, that's the common abbreviation for it because it's such a long name, um, chlorothaladone is uh, an option to try, and you should get a benefit from switching them to that. Yes? And then I think you were taught, is the HCTZ the first line for acetylamide? Um, I, I have not heard that. Um, I know that, so we'll talk about guidelines, and I believe it's ACE inhibitors or calcium channel blockers, ACE inhibitors in non-African American populations, and calcium channel blockers in African American, but I'm pretty sure. We'll, we'll get there in a few slides here, but um, thiazides are in there somewhere, and I don't, it's not like they're not recommended, but yeah. That's when I checked out today, that's where it said calcium channel blocker or diuretic. Yeah, and I think for non-African American, it's thi it's ACE inhibitor, ARBs, or diuretic. And you could switch them if you needed to. It's not like a hard and fast rule. It's just there's some evidence pushing you that way. Um, one thing to just remember about chlorothaladone, though, before I sound like I'm selling it, it does have some risks. Um, so it is a lot more potent. It will waste sodium um, like nobody's business in some patients. I've seen two really, really bad cases of hyponatremia where people were borderline schizophrenic in our ED because they started chlorothaladone. It makes me a little nervous. Not Again, that's two cases, and I worked in a busy ED for a number of years. Um, but if you get really low sodium, that's the biggest complication is altered mental status, and ultimately you can get seizures and coma. It can be really deadly. Um, so I want to be careful with that. And uh, the other problem with this is it's really long acting. So once you take a dose of it, it's stuck in your body for quite a long time. And it's going to make you urinate more. So there's a lot of things to consider with chlorothaladone. Don't just jump to it because Chad said it's more potent and works better. I would almost always recommend starting with hydrochlorothiazide first before chlorothaladone. That's just me. Um, Atolazone is a PRN super potent thiazide diuretic that's usually just used as needed for edema. It's mostly for heart failure patients who aren't, or, or um, chronic kidney disease patients who need to get fluid off and aren't responding to loop diuretics, which we'll talk about um, right now very briefly and more so during heart failure. Again, uh, these are heart failure specific medications. These are not useful for hypertension. Um, they will cause some hy hypotension. Um, they will drop the blood pressure a little bit. But loop diuretics are short acting or short duration, high potency diuretics. Their goal is to get rid of fluid and get rid of it quickly. Um, their goal isn't sustained fluid reduction for hypertensive benefits. So that's the big difference between the two. And we're going to talk about that more. So people with edema or people with kidney disease, um, they take these to help force the kidneys to, to push more fluids out. Um, you can see their nomenclature is quite a bit different than the thiazides. 
And uh, there's a couple other potassium sparing agents that aren't aldosterone related. So triamterene and ameliorite. Again, you'll see these comboed with HCTZ quite a bit. Sometimes you'll see them comboed with lisinopril as well. Or not lisinopril. Um, sometimes you'll see HCTZ comboed with lisinopril, I should say. Uh, but yeah, it's a really common to see triamterene plus HCTZ or ameliorite plus HCTZ. Again, you don't really need to do that unless the patient's K is slipping to the point where you want a little bit of a boost. And you don't want to supplement them with extra K. And a combination product can be convenient in that situation. All right, uh, next class, calcium channel blockers. Two different types of calcium channel blockers, dihydropyridines and non-dihydropyridines. Dihydropyridines are what we're concerned about when it comes to hypertension. We don't care really about non-dihydropyridine drugs. Uh, the biggest difference, and think about it, well, I try to remember my little memory game and how I remember this, but anyway, dihydropyridines uh, end in depine, so it's kind of easier to remember that they, they follow the nomenclature of what they are, if that makes sense. I don't know if that helps or not. But um, anyway, dihydropyridines act peripherally in their vasodilators. Non-dihydropyridines act centrally and they work on the heart itself and the heart rate. Uh, so they both can have effects on blood pressure, but if we're doing blood pressure specifically, we really want the dihydropyridine because you don't want to mess with somebody's heart rate if you don't need to. All right, this just shows mechanisms of action. There's calcium channel blockers. I think people may, the reason I have this on here is people might be like, well, why does it slow the heart rate and vasodilate in some areas? And just different receptors in different parts of the body. So the receptors in the heart work differently than the receptors on the, on the vascular system. So you get a different effect in different parts of the body. And the way that the drugs have been designed, they're designed to be selective for one of the subsets of receptors there. All right, uh, so our dihydropyridines, again, all end in depine. Um, amlodipine is the most common one. It was the first, well, one of the first ones that was long acting and could be taken once daily. Uh, Norvask was the brand name, and it's, again, 90% plus of people who take dihydropyridine. CCBs will be on amlodipine for hypertension. It's generic, it's relatively inexpensive, there's virtually no cardiac activity at all. So, again, for average, essential hypertensive patient, we don't want to decrease their heart rate. There's no reason to do that if you don't have to. And people's heart rate drops and you prevent it from being able to increase during exercise and stuff like that, they don't feel great. People, that's one of the reasons why beta blockers aren't first line. They make people feel crummy. Um, and so same thing with a non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker. So the fact that these don't really do anything to the heart is a plus for hypertension treatment. Philodipine, um, and nifedipine and nicardipine all have various uses. I don't really care that you know about them. If I give you a hypertensive patient, it's probably going to be amlodipine related. Um, we'll talk about nifedipine here in a second. Nifedipine's role is mostly an OB. There's actually a lot of good evidence to use it for um, pregnant patients, believe it or not, for that one specifically. They're all probably fine in pregnancy, but um, nifedipine, for whatever reason, has gotten traction in that group of patients specifically. Philodipine, I don't know when the last time I've seen that dispensed was. Nicardipine is mostly just an IV, very potent vasodilator. So um, again, I don't want you to know that for this exam. I won't test you on anything about IV products or you know emergency hypertensive uh, situations, but that would be one of the drugs we use like water when it comes to um, hypertensive emergency. And nimodipine has a very odd use. It's mostly used post-subarachnic hemorrhage. It uh, has a stabilization effect on the cerebral vasculature and prevents vasospasm, so prevents bleeding, excess bleeding after uh, hemorrhage. So again, very odd use there, and I don't care you know that for this test, or at all, really, unless you go and work in a neuro ICU, then you'll have to know it. Okay, um, so side effects, 10 to 20% prevalence. Peripheral edema is probably the one people might experience the most that's going to be annoying for them. Um, headaches, dizziness, and flushing, probably more so to start the medication, and over time the body will likely get used to that. That goes for a lot of side effects. Usually the body adapts to things like that, um, but those are going to be the most common ones. Uh, heart failure, this is getting into the weeds a little bit. Um, heart failure patients just in general are required to be on so many medications that you virtually would never have to manage their blood pressure because they're probably going to be hypotensive. So yes, we want to target a goal blood pressure in a heart failure patient, but usually they're on really high dose beta blockers and ACE inhibitors, and that drops their blood pressure so much that you don't even need to think about that. So kind of ignore that middle bullet point. Um, it'd be really, really odd. The re only reason I think I put that on there is because there are calcium channel blockers that are contraindicated in, in um, heart failure, and I just wanted to put it up there that you could technically use some of them, so it's not an across-the-board contraindication. 
Uh, metabolic effects, um, amlodipine, philodipine, and nicardipine. So again, really we're concerned about amlodipine for the vast majority of our, our um, primary care, essential hypertension patients here. But it's highly CYP3A4 metabolized. So things that interfere with CYP3A4 um, will usually recommend a dose reduction of amlodipine to avoid and uh, to avoid its excess antihypertensive effects so you aren't bottoming out your patient's blood pressure. So an example of this would be the drug simvastatin or Zocor, common cholesterol medication, also is highly CYP3A4 metabolized. Those two don't get along very well. Um, it's a really common combination, although simvastatin is not quite as common as it used to be. But um, it's one where you see a lot of people on it. And again, a lot of things are metabolized via that pathway and just want to be careful with it. It's not, there's usually recommendations for the more common things out there, but um, just something to consider if you have a, an inhibitor or a, a co current um, meta metabolized drug going through that pathway. Uh, most are pregnancy category C. I talked about nifedipine being preferred in pregnant patients. Um, and they just aren't really studied that much compared to some of the older drugs, but for the most part, they're widely accepted as well tolerated. And amlodipine probably is fine in pregnancy too. It's just nifedipine for whatever reason has a little bit more evidence with it. All right, just to talk about the non-dihydropyridines, we'll talk about this a little more with arrhythmia. Um, Deltaism's major role, it's probably the least peripherally acting. It's really a rate control agent. It's gonna decrease the heart rate. We use it a lot for our AFib patients to try and rate control them. A lot of times with those patients, if you give them deltaism um, IV, you can actually convert them out of their rhythm uh, without even shocking them. Not, I shouldn't say a lot, some. Uh, but it's mostly a rate control agent. It really doesn't have a huge role in hypertension. Verapamil is a little bit more broad spectrum, meaning it does a little bit of both. It's mostly a rate control agent. It does have some uh, peripheral use. It's very rarely used in hypertension. It'd kind of be like a fifth or sixth line option, whereas diltiazem is probably a no, no line option. It doesn't, shouldn't really affect the blood pressure a ton. might drop it a tiny bit, but it's just not useful in that category. Verapamil will have some antihypertensive effects, but it's gotten a lot of other indications, uh, specifically like migraine prophylaxis, some other odd uses there. Uh, Verapamil is an oddly used drug, not really common to see it um, chronically. And again, if it, somebody's on it, it's probably because they failed a number of other antihypertensive medications. Um, okay. Uh, I don't care you know about these right now. We'll talk about diltiazem a lot more with antiarrhythmics, so don't really worry about this in the context of hypertension. Slides here for your reference in case you're curious, but basically you're looking at decreasing heart rate, um, which has a number of things associated with it. That's pretty much the only thing I care about you knowing with these, bradycardia. All right, beta blockers. So those are our three, well, if you count ARBs and ACEs as one, three um, first-line options. And we'll come to the guidelines kind of at the end here and put it all together. All right, let's talk about beta blockers too because they're so popular um, for so many other indications outside of essential hypertension. Beta blockers end in OLOL -L or LOL, like propanolol is kind of like the archetypical original beta blocker. Um, there's a lot of different beta blockers on the market, and some of them do very different things. So it is important to know some of the differences. So this is probably one of the classes where you can't just lump them all together, unfortunately. Um, so what beta blockers are going to do uh, are going to decrease, prevent the heart rate from increasing, right? So they're having anti-chronotropic effects, negative chronotrope. Um, they don't really affect the way the the force that the heart beats, though. They shouldn't significantly. They're just going to prevent it from elevating rate. So certainly that can have an, a positive effect on hypertensive patients by decreasing their blood pressure and preventing it from getting up because you're decreasing the heart rate. Um, older drugs, generally speaking, are going to have effects on multiple beta receptors in the body. Newer ones are going to be more target specific. So you might, sort of, propranolol, for example, is sort of a non-selective beta blocker. It hits beta 1, 2 receptors, doesn't really have a preference for either one. Newer ones, like metoprolol, are more selective for beta 1 receptors on the heart. And that's ideal if you're treating a cardiovascular condition, right? You don't really want something to affect the lungs directly. Uh, and these are all the beta blockers on the market currently. Um, for this class, uh, there's a couple I want you to know specifically. I know there's a lot of them on here, and you're like, oh, you have to know all the differences of all of them. Uh, not, not really. You can kind of loop them together. What I want you to know is, first of all, having a good idea of which ones are non-selective. So non-selective means they hit beta 1 and 2. Um, so again, propranolol is kind of like the archetypical one. Uh, we don't really use propranolol for heart condition anymore. A lot of times they use it in psychiatry now to suppress the sympathetic nervous system response. So like, for example, somebody who has uh, PTSD-related nightmares, 
part of that has to do with an adrenaline response during a dream. And if you give somebody propranolol, it can actually help shut down some of that function. Uh, so that's kind of an interesting use of that. Um, but really, it doesn't have a huge role in um, hypertension management. Um, certain medications like carvedilol, uh, metoprolol, and where is bisoprolol? And bisoprolol, those three are the only three that can be used in heart failure. They're the only three with indications for it, and they're the only three that will be used. Uh, so that's a really important designation when we go in talking about heart failure patients. They're only going to be on one of those three beta blockers. Yes. Yeah, uh, so I think I've got it outlined here, but bisoprolol, carvedilol, and metoprolol are only are the only three that you can use in heart failure. So you might ask yourself, where do you use these other ones? Well, it gets confusing, and I really, I'll probably, on the exam, I'll probably almost always use metoprolol or carvedilol as my beta blocker, just because those are by far the two you're going to see the most of in practice. Atenolol used to be super popular. Um, it's a once daily medication, and it's, it's a nice choice for people who just have hypertension and you want to add a beta blocker for whatever reason. Maybe you've tried other things, it's just not working, you've kind of gotten down to the beta blocker class, they don't have a compelling indication, they don't have heart failure, a tenolol can be a nice choice just because it's twice daily, or once daily, excuse me, whereas a lot of these other ones are BID dosing. Um, a tenolol does require renal dosing though, so if you do have renal failure, it's probably not the best choice. So there are some caveats in there. Bisoprolol, um, Natalol and, and uh, Nabivalol are all newer medications that tend to be a little bit more expensive, so you don't see them used quite as much. Um, Sotalol is purely used as an antiarrhythmic, even though it technically is a beta blocker. So for the purpose of hypertension, you can wipe that out of your mind. We'll come back to it during arrhythmias. Um, Esmol, you don't have to worry about. That's IV. It's short acting. It's for hypertensive emergency. Again, just on here for reference. Labetalol um, comes as IV. And PO, it's an interesting drug. It's primarily used as an OB medicine and an emergency medicine. So its IV form is a nice fast-acting beta blocker, um, but its PO form is a really common OB application because it's it's studied in, in pregnancy and well tolerated and well known to be have to not have negative effects on the developing fetus. So um, again, for beta blockers, I will. Probably almost always use metoprolol or carvedilol, but the point is to be able to recognize the beta blocker. And when you know heart, when we talk about heart failure, we'll talk about those three specifically. And I'm not, I'll just say it right now, I'm not going to use, uh, what is it, bisoprolol. I just don't see it used all that much. So if you work on heart failure, you're going to see metoprolol and you're going to see carvedilol as the two major ones. And so that's why people often use those in other indications too, because it makes it easy if you have to switch somebody or if somebody develops heart failure later. All right. Um, what else about beta blockers? So again, uh, these are decreasing the heart rate. So usually people are going to feel a little bit fatigued. Um, it can cause even some psychiatric related conditions, such as people re report depression on beta blockers as well. It can cause impotence, especially in men, erectile dysfunction, um, bronchospasm potentially, masking diabetic symptoms. So those are kind of interesting things to talk about. So bronchospasm, the idea here, remember all our respiratory meds are beta agonists, right? So if you're blocking beta receptors, that's where having a selective one that works only on the heart comes in handy. If you have a non-selective beta blocker on board, so let's say you do are using carvedilol, which does happen to be the most common non-selective one we're using today, um, you're blocking beta receptors in the lungs. So if you give somebody an albuterol inhaler, they might not get the full effect of it because that beta block cade is on board. So that's something to consider in patients who have comorbid respiratory disease. I would not use carvedilol in a patient who has COPD. I would stick to metoprolol if you have to use a beta blocker because that's going to be non or more selective for the heart. You're going to get less interference with the lungs. Um, and ultimately, you could pound somebody with an albuterol nub or a continuous nub and hopefully overcome that blockade but it's more difficult to do that versus if you don't have the beta blocker on at all. So that's something to consider. The other thing you'll hear about beta blockers is masking diabetic symptoms. One of the symptoms of having hypoglycemia is people get tachycardic. And so that's something they might be used to knowing. If they aren't on a beta blocker, they might be knowing, well, I'm hypoglycemic. Maybe if they're type 1 diabetic or whatever it might be, or they took too much insulin. I'm hypoglycemic. I'm feeling jittery. I'm tachycardic. I'm checking my pulse. Yes, I'm tachycardic. I'm going to take some sugar. Um, beta blockers will obviously block that response. So if you have a diabetic patient, educating them on that hypoglycemic, easy to tell symptom is not going to be one they can rely on anymore. And it's not a contraindication. It's just an education point uh, with somebody. Okay, I think that's all I wanted to say about beta blockers for now. Um, just my little joke. 
-hmm. You've got the old guy, propranolol, who is non-selective at all. You've got atenolol, who's beta-1 mostly. And the new guy, carbetalol, who's non-selective. And look, I've got some alpha blockade activity too. So carbetalol has some alpha blocking capability, which we'll talk about here in a second. But basically, that causes some extra vasodilation in certain parts of the body, uh, which is why people like it in heart failure. It decreases afterload a little bit more than the other ones. All right. All right, let's talk about management. So a concept, mix and match your drug classes, and remember, we don't combine ACEs and ARBs. Otherwise, it's pretty much fair game. Compelling indications, like that first slide, is really important for where you go first uh, for those patients. And remember, when it comes to people who don't have any of those, it's sort of dealer's choice. What do you prefer? What do you like to do? I think there's a lot of um, argument for starting somebody on an ACE or an ARB just because all the compelling indications that are common, like they develop diabetes, they develop kidney, kidney disease, they develop heart failure, they're going to have to be on one of those anyway. So it makes sense to keep them on that, start them on that. Not saying they will, but again, it's just easy to not have to transition somebody to something else. Monotherapy is usually pretty effective for about 30 to 50 percent of your hypertensive patients. It will norm, normalize blood pressure. Uh, and you always want to maximize your dose within tolerability. Uh, so making sure that they're they're tolerating it okay, but optimizing that dose before you add another agent on. You could consider starting two agents. You don't have to do this, but it's recommended to consider starting two agents if your blood pressure is more than 20 over 10 above your goal. That could be a lot of patients, depending on how hypertensive the people you're seeing are. Um, but it is there is some evidence for doing using dual therapy right off the bat in those patients. I just make sure you know, I don't have to educate you guys on this because you probably are getting to some of the classes, but making sure you're getting consistent readings, multiple visits, different arms, sitting for five minutes, all the good things, not to just jump on somebody because they I mean, you guys wouldn't do that. But you know, some people I think are like, oh, this person's got hypertension. Well, he just walked across the parking lot, sat down, and he took his blood pressure 30 seconds after he was sitting. Yeah, he's probably going to be a little bit elevated compared to somebody sitting in a chair for 30 minutes. A uh, majority of patients will likely require more than one agent if significantly above goal. So it's not uncommon to have dual therapy here, of course, or triple therapy or quadruple therapy. Um, you'll see a lot of different combination strategies. Uh, but essentially, that's kind of the, the mix and match strategy there. If you had a patient who's really resistant, like, no, I'm, I know my blood pressure is high, but start me on one drug. That's fine. You don't have to fight them. If they don't want to take two drugs right at once. Um, Okay, let's talk about some of these specific indications quick. Um, again, we'll come back to heart failure again and talk about it specifically in more detail here in, in a couple slides. But uh, hypertension imposes increased hemodynamic load on the failing ventricle. You've got systolic failure, um, and you're going to end up reducing the afterload uh, by decreasing the blood pressure, and that can have major improvements on stroke volume. It can also help the heart remodel itself over time if there's not that consistent pressure on it. Um, order of required therapy, ACEs, beta blockers, loop diuretics for fluids, and then aldosterone antagonists. Those four are the cornerstone of heart failure, and we'll talk about that in a lot of slides here in a second. Post-MI uh, sounds going to be sound pretty similar to our heart failure patients. Again, it's a structural heart disease related thing, so we're decreasing preload and afterload. ACEs, ARBs, and beta blockers. All post-MI patients should be on those two. Required therapy, proven mortality benefits. And again, we'll come back to that in ACS. We'll talk about that in more detail. Diabetes, um, ACEs and ARBs uh, protect against increased albinuria. They have um, some kidney protective benefits there. Thiazide diuretics, calcium channel blockers are also fine. You just usually want to start with an ACE and then work your way down from there. Stroke TI, uh, strokes or trans ischemic attacks. Um, generally treat everyone, whether they're hypertensive or not. Uh, unless they're really low already or normal tensive, you could probably, like if they're below, um, 120 over 70, probably not worth bottoming them out for the sake of benefit here. Um, there's a couple different recommendations. Most of the newer things would say, the older recommendations is ACE plus thiazide. Newer recommendations would say ACE or CCB as monotherapy. Um, thiazide probably isn't solid enough on its own as monotherapy. You probably want to combine it with something else um, to get the mortality benefits for a post-stroke patient. Combo therapy, ACE and CCB. Um, showed to have some slightly better evidence than ACE plus thiazide. So um, again, thiazide was kind of the mainstay in stroke with the ACE inhibitor combo, and it's sort of moved away from that in more recent years. But essentially all of the classes we've talked about are fine. And you can assume when I say ACE, unless I specifically tell you, I mean ACE ARB is, is okay in those situations. Okay, some other, uh, so those are the most common compelling indications I think we see, and we just wanted to walk through those. We'll talk about kidney disease ad nauseum in a couple 
a month here or so. So we'll get, get to all that too. So don't feel like I'm cheating you on that right now. Uh, other drugs. I talked about alpha blockers already. <clears throat> Very limited use, mostly men, BPH. That's going to be your primary candidate here. Um, I don't see these used in women a whole lot. Not to say you couldn't. They, women will get an antihypertensive effect from them. It's just a matter of are you going to get to that drug class. It's kind of a bottom line for a, a woman. But for an older man, uh, yeah, it almost jumps up to the first line choice for them. Um, alpha blockers cause a lot of orthostatic hypotension, and that's going to be their biggest side effect and biggest drawback people are going to experience on them. So if you have an older person who falls a lot already or is on blood thinners, probably not the best idea. Uh, other options, these are like the utility meds that you've hit the kitchen, or you throw in the kitchen sink at your patient and they're still hypertensive, where do you go? Uh, clonidine is a good one to remember. It's a centrally acting alpha-2 agonist. It works um, in the brain to decrease vasomotor outflow and ultimately you reduce um, sympathetic tone and it decreases blood pressure that way. It comes um, orally and as a transdermal patch. The patch is once a week, which could be a really nice option for like a older adult maybe who struggles to remember their medications or something like that. But um, it's got a really fast onset when taken orally. This is a nice drug to try as well because a lot of people don't take clonidine. It's not a common, it's not part of the guidelines. It's a first line choice. So let's say you have somebody who comes into your urgent care and they have hypertension and they're on a beta blocker, they're on a mace, they're on a calcium channel blocker. You're like, well, what do I go to now? Well, if you give them a dose of clonidine, you can actually see effects of clonidine within 30 minutes and whether it drops their blood pressure. So I always think of that again as a nice back pocket one to know that it's, it has a different mechanism than the other things we've talked about. You can use it in combination with all the other things we've talked about and it's got a really fast onset. So you're gonna see results pretty quickly with it. It does cause bradycardia, some drowsiness and fatigue, similar to what you might see with a, with a beta blocker, but it doesn't mean you can't use them together. Just watch the heart rate on it. <clears throat> Hydralazine is another one to think about using too. Um, it's a direct arterial vasodilator. It comes IV NPO. It's very fast acting. It's probably biggest limitation are two things. First of all, it's TID, QID dosing, and it causes a fair amount of flushing and possibly even angina in some patients. So um, not the best. These two aren't the greatest tolerated medications. Not that they aren't effective. They just aren't well tolerated and they don't have a huge body of evidence behind them. But they are certainly good options if everything else isn't working well. Uh, methyl dopa and pregnancy uh, options. So I think we've talked about all these other ones except for methyl dopa. Methyl dopa is kind of a clonidine analog. I don't even know if I want to talk about it because it went off the market last spring and I don't know if it's coming back or not. It just disappeared. Uh, so we can't get it anymore. It's not a good drug. It's not, I mean, it, it's got sedating side effects, really slow onset, very mild antihypertensive effects. The only reason it's on here is because it's been studied. Sorry, that should say methyl dopa. There's an L between the Y and the D typo. Uh, the only reason it's still on here is because um, it's got a body of evidence with it associated with pregnant patients and positive outcomes um, that are not negative towards the developing fetus. So it's well tolerated in pregnancy. People can use it without uh, negative adverse effects. Uh, but beta blockers like labetalol and CCBs like nifedipine are much more potent. They're much more fast acting and they're going to be the mainstays you're going to see in uh, peripartum hypertension. Hydralazine is also an option too, but just because of its side effect profile, labetalol and nifedipine are better tolerated. They're going to be used more often than uh, hydralazine. Uh, so and one of the interesting things, I'll just throw this out here. There's a, a study, a couple studies that have come out that have shown that if you take oral nifedipine, you actually get as fast of a response as you do if you give somebody IV labetalol, which is almost unheard of. From a pharmacokinetic standpoint, it makes no sense, but um, here we are uh, learning things in my you know, eighth year of practicing pharmacy. So um, yeah, so our OB people are like, well, we want to put this as a first line option. It's like, it's oral. Why don't you want IV? And they're like, oh, look at this study. And sure enough, there is some evidence to support that. So kind of interesting. All right, um, that's it. Let's take a five minute break and then we'll come back and do the first half of the heart failure lecture.